أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في العرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه وأرواح العالمين Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight for this series of lectures uh, in which we'll try and set the uh, tone for a truly exceptional opportunity that is upon us. The month of Ramadan is a time that if invested in the right manner will in fact allow us to get on the projectile that will create truly extraordinary lives out of otherwise mundane ones. And I think a lot of times what happens is that the month of Ramadan, especially in the first few days of it, people rush through, they're still trying to, um, uh, if you like, trying to learn the routine, trying to get into the act, trying to uh, do the fasting right, to get the rituals right. And so before you know it, the month of Ramadan is over. and. It's towards the end of the month that we kind of have a lot of people asking uh, as to how it all just went by so quickly and what they can do to maximize the benefits of, of this holy month. But that's kind of when it's too late, right? And so what we're trying to do this year, and I think it's a great initiative by the brothers and sisters who have put this program together, is that we're trying to prepare ourselves such that when the, when the holy month of Ramadan begins, that from day one, in fact, we are reaping the maximum possible benefit from this extraordinary opportunity. And so let me start out by asking a simple question. And that question is, what would you change about yourself? Now, I get it. These types of probing personal questions could throw anyone off balance. And I'm not trying to get you to answer the question, I'm not trying to invade your privacy, I'm not trying to learn anything about uh, your very private lives. What I'm trying to get you to do is to think about this question. In the solitude of your own mind, if you are asked, what would you change about yourself? I think nine times out of ten, excluding those who are incredibly arrogant and actually think that they're, they've got nothing to change or improve about themselves, but nine times out of ten people will come up with a list of things they'd like to change about themselves. Now, mind you, and I think this is a given as well, everybody understands this, I'm not talking about changes that have to do with your appearance or how much money you make, right? I'm not talking about changes that require plastic surgery. I'm talking about changes that are more substantial. Most people can get through life with a pointy nose. Most people can get through life with a little less money than the Joneses. What we can't get through life with is the things that make us truly hideous. It's not about how you appear. Because let's face it, and I think this is a pretty common cliche that's kind of overused, but it helps to, to remind ourselves. 
Beauty, they say, is in the eyes of the beholden because your own mother, perhaps, might not be a beauty queen. But because she's your mother and because you know her, you truly know her, and how much she cares for you and how much she loves you, you actually see her as the most beautiful person in the world. And so it's quite obvious that it's not so much getting rid of that pointy nose, getting the nose job, or getting you know, any of those things that people do nowadays, the things that are trending all over the world. Australia, in fact, they say is one of, one of the countries where plastic surgery is, 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 is very, very common. South Korea, they say, is number one. I think the Middle East probably comes second. And then you have all of these other nations that are so insecure about themselves and how they look that they end up spending a small fortune on trying to get that perfect toned face or body. Again, I'm not talking about these things. I'm not talking about shedding a few pounds or getting a six pack. I'm talking about the things that truly make a difference. For instance, moral character traits. Again, if I were to repeat the question, what would you change about yourself? I'm sure that some of us will start to think, well, I suffer from envy. I have the tendency to be jealous when I see someone doing well. I kind of feel deep down in my mind that I wish they didn't have that. Right? There might be a sense of immorality, dishonesty. There might be these, you know, tiny little character traits like being slanderous behind people's backs, being hypocritical. There's a hadith that says one, as a sign of a hypocrite. Now you think of a hypocrite, and the classic example that pops in your mind, I'm sure, will be the one who takes very good care of their prayers when there are other people watching. So when there's an audience, their performance is the best. When there is no audience, they don't really need to put in all that effort, right? But the hadith goes a step further. The imam says that a hypocrite will actually feel energized when they have an audience. In other words, it's not all an act. No, they actually have the extra energy and the motivation to extend that prayer from five minutes per prayer to 15 minutes without being bothered the slightest bit. Hypocrisy creates energy. It creates extra motivation. It's unbelievable if you think about it. And so what would you change about yourself? Again, I'm sure you can think of many different things. And it's not the menial things. It's not the trivial. It's not the issues. And let's make a very important distinction here. There are things that you're born with. For instance, your race, your ethnicity, your skin color your gender. And because you're born with these traits and you exercise no choice in which variation of these traits you have, therefore they are completely irrelevant as far as your value is concerned. So you can never be proud of being a man or a woman or black or white or Arab, or Persian, or Chinese, or tall, or short. These aren't things you can be proud of. Why? Because you never exerted any effort to attain them, or to shed them. They're innate, meaning that you're born with them. The things that you can be proud of are the achievements that you produce using your own, your own hard work. To be an honest person, that's something to be proud of. I'm not saying to boast about it, but to actually deep down feel that... In fact, we have a hadith of Prophet Ibrahim. When, he, when his beard turned gray, he said, Alhamdulillah, that I have turned my beard gray in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's something to be pleased about. Not to be overly pleased about, not to boast about, but again, to feel that you've done something right. And that's good, you have a right to do that. 
And it's only those character traits, the moral traits, that you actually exercise an effort to attain that you can be proud of. Everything else is completely irrelevant. So what do you do? You start by probing yourself. Now let me um, say something here. The Qur'an talks about the benefits of thinking, the benefits of thought. And of course, the Qur'an isn't the only book that talks about the benefits of thinking. You ask any um, life coach, you ask any entrepreneur, any investor, any businessman, as to whether they value thinking, and they'll say, absolutely. You have to think, you have to consider what you're getting into. Without thinking, you're never going to achieve anything of value, right? The problem is, I think, many people make the mistake of confusing thought with the absorption of information. Let me tell you what the difference is. Most of us are absorbing information as we go about our lives. There is an onslaught of little factoids that are being presented to you on a daily basis. Whether you're surfing the net or watching the television or even reading the paper or talking to a friend or having a conversation, there's always information being exchanged. But is that really what the Qur'an praises? When the Qur'an talks about those who think, أَفَلَا يَتَفَكَّرُونَ is he talking about information being bounced off of different people and using different mediums and us absorbing them? Is that what the hadith talks about? For instance, we have a hadith that says, كانت أكثر عبادتي أبي ذر التفكر. That's one hadith. That the greatest act of worship performed by the likes of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari Abu Dhar, about whom traditions say he had reached the ninth, in other words, one of the highest levels of faith and servitude and obedience to Allah. One of the most common form of worship that he engaged in was to think. Is he talking about that? The other hadith, which is often quoted, but I believe quoted completely out of context, is التفكر ساعة خير أو أفضل من عبادة سبعين سنة. To think for an hour is better than worshiping Allah in an un unadulterated, undistracted, focused manner for eighty years. It doesn't make. Does that make sense? So let's all stop worshiping, sit down, and think for an hour. Think about anything. We all think, but again, we're making a. We're making. Um, uh, there, there's confusion here between absorbing information or another way to, to refer to it sometimes it's a cost-benefit analysis again let me give you an example you want to buy a new car so what do you do? you research you think about all the options available you think about financing options you think about the features of the particular car that you're interested in. You go out there, you inspect it, you test drive it, you do all sorts of different things. And commonly we refer to this as thinking. But you're not exactly thinking. You're engaging in a cost-benefit analysis. You're thinking in the sense that you're considering the pros and cons of the action that you're about to embark on or engage in. But that's not thinking. Here's what thinking is. Thinking is to consider the ultimate, not the immediate, not the short term, not the medium term, but the ultimate consequences of the action. When the hadith says that an hour of thinking equates or supersedes 80 years of worship, what the imam is telling us is that for you to sit down and actually think about the most fundamental questions in your life. To actually think critically, and, and this is a very important distinction. To think critically 
as opposed to simply absorb information or engage in a cost-benefit analysis for your own personal pleasure. To think, if I'm going to buy a car, for instance, let's, let's use this metaphor. If I am going to buy a car, is this car in the best of my interest ultimately, in the very long run? Now when you start asking questions like that, suddenly the type of car you will buy will be drastically different. Suddenly how you buy the car, where you make the money from, how you finance it, there will be huge differences. Why? Because you're considering the ultimate outcome as opposed to the immediate benefit or harms associated with this act. Now, as part of thinking and as part of probing yourself, brothers and sisters, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, since we're talking about change and we're talking about how to improve ourselves and how to maximize the benefits of the month of Ramadan, what is the meaning of true success? What is success? Now, you look up the dictionary definition of success, and it'll say something like maximizing material possessions, or acquiring power. I, I actually looked it up and this is what it says. And I was surprised, because you can easily replace the word success with profit, and it's the exact same definition, but is it? Is that what success is? To have more material objects in your possession. That's, that's what you call success? So someone, obviously, if you're looking at it from a purely materialistic standpoint, that is what success is. The more digits you have in your bank account, the more successful you are. The more fame you have, the more successful you are. The word fame was also used. So if you're famous and you happen to be a celebrity of some kind, you have a recognizable face, you're also successful. But are you? You could be infamous, and that still fits the definition of success. Someone who's loathed and hated is also, in one way, successful, because they've achieved that recognition, that fame. Or to have power, for you to be able to call the shots, hire people, fire people, wage wars, that's also success, because you're powerful, because you can mobilize the masses. Again, replace the word success with profit, and it's the exact same thing, they're synonymous. But that's not real success, is it? We all know that. Because you could be a multi-billionaire and have to take antidepressants because you are so depressed that the only thing that can allow you to function throughout your life, your daily life, is if you take Prozac pills, which means you'll be floating. You're on drugs all the time. You're high all the time. And that's the only way you can overcome that depressed, anxious lifestyle of yours where you're living your life in the fast lane all the time. Always trying to get one more contract signed, one more client brought in, one more, you know, uh, digit added to your bank account. That doesn't exactly make you a successful person. And let me give you another example to highlight the distinction here. You have one thing that we refer to as your character and your reputation. What's the difference between these two? Reputation is how you are perceived in the eyes of others. You have a reputation for being strong, for being powerful, for being assertive. But your character is not your perceived personality, it is what you really are. Now there's a huge difference. Character is the main focus here, not reputation. Although, again, in, 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 in the life that we see in the 21st century, a lot of people simply give up on character. Why? And, and we'll get to that. They'll give up on improving their character because it's too hard because it's uncomfortable, because they'd rather stick with the status quo, they'd have to get out of their comfort zones. So what do they do? Polish up their reputations. Because polishing up and photoshopping your external image is a lot easier than having to deal with the internal problems. 
But what really matters at the end of the day isn't your reputation, it's not your image, it's who you really are. And that's why the most famous celebrities in the world, their marriages always break up, or most of the time. Why? Because as polished as their image is in the outside, on the billboards and on the tabloids, their character is vile. Their internal traits are crooked. They're messed up. And because internally they're crooked and they're vile, they'll never be able to live with their spouses. They'll never be able to, to function in a civil manner with those people closest to them. So, you have to ask yourself, what is your definition of success? This is us trying to engage in thinking. What is success to you? And I believe perhaps one of the best definitions of, of success isn't acquiring more, it isn't having more, it isn't being powerful. Rather, it is trying to do the right thing. And the reason I say trying as opposed to actually doing the right thing is because ultimately it doesn't matter what your act or what your actions, what sort of results they will, lead, they will yield perceived by you. And what I mean by that is sometimes you do something right. Not for the fame, not for the money, not because you're going to reap any benefit out of it in your lifetime. Now that, I, I was reading about humanist philosophies. And in the United States, uh, you know how they have chaplains, religious chaplains in many different universities and army units and so forth. So you have Muslim chaplain, a Jewish chaplain, Christian chaplain, different denominations of Christianity. In some of these more liberal, progressive types of universities in the U.S., they have a, hum a humanist chaplain. And what that means is basically a synonym for atheist. But instead of saying an atheist chaplain because it makes absolutely no sense, it's an oxymoron, instead they've come up with this whole philosophy behind atheism. And so they call it humanism. And humanism, they'll tell you, is us humans trying to do the right thing with God completely absent from the equation. So if God didn't exist, how would I treat my fellow human being? A humanist will say, well, we'll try to empathize with you. If you're going through pain, if you're going through hardship, if you're aching on the inside, as a humanist, I don't need God to tell me that the right thing to do is for me to engage with you, to try and relieve your pain by getting close to you, by trying to understand what you're going through, right? So, on the face of it, it sounds very fancy, it sounds nice, it sounds very human. But in reality, if you take God out of the equation, there really is no reason for you to spend an extra second trying to comfort someone, unless that comfort you're offering them is going to benefit you at some point down the line. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Now, you might say, what goes around comes around. Right? You might say that I will treat him justly and I will treat him with kindness because if I do that, I, other people will treat me in the same way. But what about the times when nobody's watching? What about the times when you're not really teaching anybody a lesson? You're not being preachy. What if you find a dog in the desert, the dog can never benefit you, and, and you, in fact, you have water for yourself. As a humanist, it makes absolutely no sense to do that. It would be idiotic to do that. Whereas a God-centric moral philosophy, brothers and sisters, Islamic philosophy, the philosophy of the Ahlul Bayt, is one that teaches you that regardless of benefits to you, in fact, regardless of consequences, you have to do the right thing because God's watching. Because the right thing is worthy of being done. Again, it doesn't matter what you take out of it. What matters is you do the right thing. Why? There's, there's an added bonus to all of this. There's a silver lining, if you like. And that is we've got heaven. 
we've got hell. We have paradise. And what you do here will, in fact, reflect in your life in the hereafter. So, moving on. For you to think about your definition of success, number one. Number two, to think about the fact that, brothers and sisters, we are upon a new season of spirituality, a new season of getting a boost from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our lives are getting shorter and shorter. One commentator on the Qur'an says that, I always read the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Asr, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرٍ But I never really fully appreciated the meaning of this verse until one day I was out in the hot scorching sun and when it gets really really hot in Najaf and Karbala and Iraq in general but particularly in Najaf you better stay right away because the heat will become absolutely unbearable which is actually what's going to happen during this holy month of Ramadan and we pray for all the believers out there having to struggle with the threat of terrorism and the heat and the fasting and all these different things. It's an incredible test. So this commentator, this professor of the Quran says that I came out, there was something important I had to do and there was nobody out there because it was so scorching hot. And he says that I, I looked around, there was no one in the, in the market except me and then suddenly I heard someone crying out, screaming, Buy from me what is my ultimate capital before it melts. He was saying, buy from me my capital. In other words, all my material possessions. It's, it's all I have. Buy it before it melts away. So I thought to myself, what's going on? So I approached him and I noticed that the poor guy was selling ice blocks. And he was pleading, he was begging for people to come and buy his ice blocks because let's face it, every extra second that he spends out there in that heat will mean that his ice will melt away and before late the whole thing is completely gone and he's got nothing. For us brothers and sisters to think about the fact that our lives are being squandered we are one year older than we were last year and two years older than we were two years ago. And if you think about it from that perspective, you know, sometimes you hear things, uh, people saying that 30 is the new 20, you know, or garbage of the, of the, of the sort. And, and that, of course, we know it's not true. Most of you here, I suppose, you're in the prime of your lives. 20 is the new 15 and 15 is the new I mean the, the, the fact of the matter is that our lives are being wasted away our most precious capital is going is melting away and we think that we still have time in fact scientists and statisticians talk about how when you're in your 20s you are the most productive you'll ever be do you know why that's depressing brothers and sisters it's depressing because when I look at myself, when I'm in my 20s, I'm, I'm the laziest person you'll find. And if, if my productivity at the age of 25 is this low, it's, it's all downhill from here, as they say. It's only going to get worse. If I'm this lazy, when I'm 17, 18, 20, 25, 27, 30, 35, imagine how I'll be when I'm 65 or 75. It's incredibly depressing. It's a, it's a sobering thought for, for me to think that I am really not being as productive as I can. So I'll go back to the definition of success that I stated earlier. For me to try my best to do the right thing. And my best means that we'll have to work a little harder. A little harder than what we are at the moment. Because think about it, the month of Ramadan, out here in this country, where it's cold, where the days are short, where I am young and I'm healthy and I'm comfortable and I'm living in relative prosperity. If I don't take advantage of those opportunities, 
When am I going to take advantage of them? When am I actually going to make a difference using this extraordinary chance that's, that's been presented to me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So let's think about those things. Now, moving on to change and to change those negative character traits and to change those bad habits that uh, each one of us will, uh, I'm sure, have to a degree one or two of them at the very least. The problem, of course, with changing bad habits is that it's an uncomfortable process. They say that old habits die hard. And that's very true. In fact, we have a hadith that says changing your habits is like a miracle. So it's almost like saying you need a miracle to change a bad habit. The reason for that is pretty simple. Because we are conditioned with those habits. You know, think about it. A bad habit is abhorrent and uncomfortable and evil and bad only the first time you do it. After that, you become, it becomes second nature to you. It becomes a part of who you are. And that's what makes it so incredibly hard to shed. And what ends up happening is, as I say here, a minor infraction quickly evolves into a moral transgression. Meaning that the, the other problem with bad habits, other than the difficulty of shedding them, is that they start out very small and they lead to other greater, more detrimental bad habits. It starts out with a little white lie and before you know it, you're the CEO of a major banking corporation stealing and gobbling up billions of dollars and not losing a single second of sleep over it. Before you know it, there is sexual inf marital infidelity. Before you know it, there is sins being committed, committed left, right and center. Because you're, you're now comfortable. Right? And there's another problem with it, and that has to do with the fact that people lose hope of redemption, which I don't want to talk about. We've talked about it in the past. The problem with bad habits growing and evolving into more dangerous character traits is because with every single one of them, we become more shameless and therefore more careless towards those actions. And so it's not just a simple faux pas, as they say. It's no longer an accident. It's no longer a mistake. It becomes second nature to me. It becomes something that I simply won't be able to shed. It's like a cancer, really. Starts out small, a single, you know, the, the, I, I remember seeing these ads online, uh, government sponsored ads that talk about melanoma and how that if you expose yourself to the sun, even for a very, very short amount of time, if you're not protected with sunscreen or what have you, right? These government ads were saying that even a minute of exposure to the sun could irreparably change your genetic code to allow for mutations to occur and for melanoma and other types of cancer uh, 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 tumors to appear. So it, it only takes one slip up. It only takes one tiny mistake. For the second mistake, again, we're not saying that with the first sin, we're turning into another Yazid or Muawiyah. What I'm saying is that with the first sin, the second sin becomes more bearable. It becomes more tolerable. It becomes something that's not as bad as the first one. And so on and so forth. In other words, you're throwing yourself down the hill you're rolling down the hill with the first sin. With the first, we call them bad habits, but really what we're talking about is sinful habits. We're talking about sinful thoughts and sinful actions. And when that takes place, when you get to that level where, when I said, think about what you would change about yourself, and suddenly you could think of 20 different things, now that's a very troubling sign. That means that you've reached a level where you need drastic measures. You can't, it's like when somebody has a very aggressive type of cancer, they can no longer resort to herbal remedies. What they need is either a powerful dose of chemotherapy or 
to have the tumor taken out surgically. They need a very invasive operation to take it out. They need very powerful action. And that's what we're getting at tonight, inshallah. So, while change is undesirable, you ask any smoker how they feel about the fact that their habits could potentially, I'm not saying absolutely, right? You always have aberrations from the norm, you have exceptions to the rule. But potentially, they could end up developing all kinds of lung disease, heart disease, cancers, and so forth. How will they justify the act, act to you? First of all, I believe they'll treat you in such a way that you'll stop asking them about it. So the first time you bring it up, they'll shrug it off, they'll look away, they'll change the subject, and you'll get the message. <laughs> right? But what I'm concerned about is not how they justify it to you, to others, that is, how they would justify it to themselves. And because it's uncomfortable to quit, it's undesirable. It's not something people generally want to do. Again, people are comfortable where they are, whichever way they are. And the minute you start talking about change is when they start cringing. Right? Now that change, again, it could be the most simple physical things like their excessive weight, if they happen to be obese, if they smoke, if they smoke shisha too often, whatever the case may be. It's, it's not something they want to give up because it's difficult to do so. The problem is, change is inevitable. As they say, everything in, not in life is subject to change except change itself. That's the only constant in life. There's always change happening. And when we're talking about, within the context of sin and moral transgressions, when we're talking about those issues, either I change now before it's too late, and, and that's another thing with habits, there, there comes a point when it's too late. You know how hard it is right now to give up a bad habit? Think of it this way. Every second that goes by, every day of your life that you put behind you, it's getting increasingly difficult to shed that bad habit. It's not getting any easier. And you're not getting any younger. In 20 years time, it'll be, it'll be a lot harder to quit this bad habit than it is right now. So your best chance, mark my words, brothers and sisters, your best possible chance is right now. Right now. Not even, not even to say, I'll do it this coming month of Ramadan. No, right now. The commitment has to be made now, although the month of Ramadan gives you an extra boost, which we'll talk about. So when it comes to sins, either you give them up now, or, and this is the best case scenario, as a believer, when we die, we're have, we have to go through a purgatorial process of cleansing. As believers, I'm not talking about the non-believers, I'm not talking about the evildoers, as people who stand the best chance of going to paradise, we have to be cleansed in the barzakh. We have to suffer in the intervening period between our death and our resurrection. This, this world of barzakh. And there is so much in our narrations about the barzakh and about what we go through. But the general gist of it is that it's purgatory. Not the Catholic sense of purgatory, but purgatory in the sense that you get cleansed if you are going to go to paradise. If you're not going to go to paradise, then your punishment begins from day one. But if you are, and we hope we all are, inshallah, we have to get cleansed, cleansed, and it's not, it's not going to be pleasant. Let's just put it that way. It's having to suffer. And one example that I always kind of mention when... when the subject of barzakh comes up, is imagine if we actually don't go through any physical punishment in our graves. If, if there is absolutely nothing physical about it, just imagine this. If our time in the grave passes only as one big, long, never-ending nightmare, 
Imagine the suffering that we go through. Imagine if our souls simply had a film showed to it. Where it's, it's a nightmare. So we think it's real even though it's not. Imagine if I have to go through that for 10,000 years or 10 million years or whatever number of years it takes before our resurrection. Imagine that. And so either we change now, brothers and sisters, or we go through this purgatorial process which is unpleasant, which is painful, which is hard, which you want to avoid at all costs. Listen to what the Imam says. فَمَنْ يَكُونُ أَسْوَأُ حَالًا مني. Again, we're trying to consider the ultimate consequences. We're trying to think about where I will be at the moment of my death. Not now, not tomorrow, but when I'm dying. Listen to these beautiful words. فَمَنْ يَكُونُ أَسْوَأُ حَالًا مني. Who's worse off than I am? إن أنا نقلت على مثل حالي إلى قبر لم أمهده لرقدتي. If I'm taken to a grave that I haven't prepared for my sleep, I haven't put in the. I never even considered the possibility of being in that grave. I never even thought about what I need to do so that I could find some peace and comfort in that grave. Who's worse than me when I'm suddenly shocked into death? When I awaken into death and inside my grave. And I haven't placed the mattress of good deeds so that I could find some comfort and peace in that grave. Why would I not shed tears of agony? And this is Imam Zayn al-Abideen talking about. I don't even know where I'm going to end up. I don't know what's going to happen to me in that grave and in the hereafter. And I'm always, I am prone to my own deception. That's, that's the, 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 the enslavement that we have given into. My soul deceives me and I follow it like a sheep. And and my days are playing hide and seek with me. Beautiful metaphors and expressions. Hide and seek in the sense that I'm running after them and then they're not there. And before I know it, the day is lapsed and my life is behind me and I'm no longer the 25 year old that I was, energetic, powerful, motivated. I'm now a sagging 45, 55, 65 year old with no future, no past, no present. Absolute and utter confusion. وَقَدْ خَفَقَتْ عَنْدَ رَأْسِي أَجْنِحَةُ الْمَوْتِ And I can see the shadows of death coming over me. I can see the signs of death all over, all over my life. I can see people dropping dead around me, within my own family, my circle of friends and acquaintances. There's always a new person dying every day. And yet I think I'm going to survive. I think I'm going to live forever. And then the Imam again asks those probing invasive questions that we talked about. How is it that every time I say, this time it'll be different? This month of Ramadan, I'll make those necessary changes that I want to. This time I'm going to spend as much time as I can in worship and in prayer. And yet what happens is, just as I get up to do that, suddenly I, feel, I, 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 I doze off. I feel lethargic and I feel tired and I feel bored. And I feel like going back into the living room, switching on the TV and watching those endless serials being shown. In the month of Ramadan, the month of spirituality is boom time for TV channels and, and satellite networks and so forth. Stealing, robbing people of this most precious opportunity. In fact, you know what? And this is how miserable we are. It is God Himself who makes me lethargic. Because He knows that I'm not sincere. Because He knows that I'm not genuine. He knows this is just me making those same old promises, same old commitments, but not really trying to live up to them. And so he makes me sleepy. 
And that's the test. If you're able to overcome that initial state of mind where you're tired and lethargic and bored, if you're able to persist, if you're able to say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And if you're, if you're feeling you know, tired and lethargic, to actually cry for the fact that you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making you feel tired and lethargic. Cry for the fact that it's my deeds and my actions which have led me to where I am today. Where I can't be bothered to spend a few moments of worship between me and Allah. I must have done something wrong. What have I done? وَسَلَبْتَنِي مُنَاجَاتِكَ إِذَا أَنَا نَاجَيْتُكَ And you take away that intimate conversation as I begin to engage in it with you. مَالِي كُلَّ مَا قُلْتُ قَدْ صَلُحَتْ سَرِيرَتِي What is it about me? Again, the Imam blames himself. He says, what have I done? Not in, a, in, in disobedience. Not, he, uh, the Imam isn't objecting to God's decree. He's asking, he's, he's probing himself. He's saying, why is it that every time I say, I will change, something goes wrong. <laughs> Suddenly something happens and I slip. Something happens and I fall. وَحَالَتْ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ خِدْمَتِكَ سَيِّدِي لَعَلَّكَ عَنْ بَابِكَ تَرَدْتَنِي Oh my master, is it so that you have thrown me away from your court? Is it so that you have rejected me from your doorstep? Is that what it is? Or is it something else? وَعَنْ خِدْمَتِكَ نَحَيْتَنِي And you have relieved me of your service. You have fired me from this duty of mine. أَوْ لَعَلَّكَ رَأَيْتَنِي مُسْتَخِفًّا بِحَقِّكَ Again, it is these small habits that pile up to the, and bring us to the point of self-annihilation. It is my own actions. He says, have you found me treating your right lightly? Is it that I treat God lightly? Is it that God has no priority or special place in my life? Is that what it is? So that you had فَأَقْصَيْتَنِي You have exiled me. Allahu Akbar. To be exiled from the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the service, ser, service of Allah. Never to come back, never to return. أَوْ لَعَلَّكَ رَأَيْتَنِي مُعْرِضًا عَنْكَ فَقَلَّيْتَنِي أَوْ لَعَلَّكَ وَجَدْتَنِي فِي مَقَامِ الْكَاذِبِينَ فَرَفَضْتَنِي أَوْ لَعَلَّكَ رَأَيْتَنِي غَيْرَ شَاكِرِ لِلْنَعْمَائِكَ فَحَرَمْتَنِي Not being thankful, not being truthful. Again, all of these things, brothers and sisters, they add up. They add up. Every sin that we commit takes away just a little bit of that light. It takes away the chance and the opportunity a lot of those who commit sins, it's, it's incredible. They commit sins thinking in the back of their minds that I will repent. But repentance, we have to understand, this is, a, is an endowment, it's a gift. Repentance isn't something that you, you, you initiate. Allah initiates the repentance. Allah has to give you the chance to speak to Him, to ask Him for forgiveness before you do that. And with every sin, that chance is taken away from us to actually repent. Which is why you'll, I'm sure you know a lot of people in, in, in society who have reached the level where they wouldn't even say Astaghfirullah anymore. They'll never even say it. Now how much will it cost them to say Astaghfirullah? Nothing, right? But that chance is taken from them. It's been seized. They can't even say the words anymore. We have a hadith and on the day of judgment, the Quran alludes to this as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands everyone to bow down in worship, to prostrate, and there are those who can't. Well, we have examples of that in this life. You say to them, repent to Allah, astaghfir rabbak. Go to hajj, go to ziyarat al-Imam al Hussein. do something for yourself to redeem your actions. And they wouldn't. And they wouldn't. They can't. Not that they are destined or they're forced. No, they're never forced. You always have the opportunity. No matter what your background, no matter wh where you came from, no matter what, you've, what your track record, your report card looks like, you still have a chance. 
Look at the examples of Hurm, look at the examples of some of the children of the worst enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. Right? People like Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, people like those who sided with Imam al-Husayn on the day of Ashura. Hur wasn't the only one, by the way. There were several others. Which tells you that no matter what you've done, you can still chuck a yui, as they say. You can still turn around. Solid commitment. Where if you feel sleepy or bored or just not in the mood, that does not deter you. Where if something comes up to distract you from your prayer or from your, your worship, that does not distract you. So what do we need in order to initiate some meaningful change in our lives? We need several components to come together. The more of these, the better, the easier the process becomes. Number one, you need the right timing. And by right timing, I mean several things. The month of Ramadan is a very, very special time. And it's special in many different respects. Number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the universe, has blessed this time. If you think about it, it's amazing because Allah is not subject to time and space. Just as Allah blesses certain places, He blesses certain times. Time is another creation of Allah. Time, just like the Kaaba, the month of Ramadan, just like the Kaaba, they're both blessed by Allah. Now, what that blessing means is another discussion that we'll leave for another day. But just to give you something to think about, we have a hadith that says, we all know that Allah, for instance, we refer to Allah as being angered, right? But what does that mean? For God to become angry. In other words, for veins to pop in his forehead, astaghfirullah, of course that's not the case. Allah has not, it doesn't have a physical form. And because Allah has no physical form, Allah's state of mind, quote unquote, does not change. Allah doesn't go through emotional roller coasters, right? So what does it mean for Allah to be angered or for Allah to be pleased? The hadith says, رِضَاهُ جَنَّتُهُ وَغَضَبُهُ نَارُهُ Allah's pleasure is manifested in paradise. Allah's pleasure has an indicator and a manifestation. The indicator are the prophets, the apostles, the Ahlul Bayt and Fatima al-Zahra in particular. Fatima al-Zahra narrations, you're all familiar with them. That if مَنْ أَرْضَاهَا فَقَدْ أَرْضَانِي وَمَنْ أَرْضَانِي فَقَدْ أَرْضَ اللَّهِ So the indicator of God's pleasure is Fatima to Zahra being pleased. But there is a manifestation, there's a reflection of this pleasure, not the indication. And the reflection is paradise. It is Allah blessing you, giving you comfort, peace. Right? And the anger of Allah, the indicator is prophets, messengers, apostles, our holy prophet and Fatima al-Zahra and the Imams and the manifestation is the fires of hell. When Allah has angered, what, what that really means is that the, the fires of hell, the inferno rages on. That's what it means. It burns the evildoers. That's a manifestation of God's anger. So a manifestation of Allah's blessings is the month of Ramadan. What that means is as the Prophet refers to in his sermon, it means that everything, everything you do in the month of Ramadan is also blessed. It's like you, guess that you get a, 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 a boost in everything you do. Suddenly all your deeds, all your actions have greater value. Suddenly, أَنْفَاسُكُمْ فِيهِ تَسْبِيحٍ نَوْمُكُمْ فِيهِ عِبَادٍ Notice, the Prophet isn't saying in this very famous hadith, the Prophet isn't saying, that your sleep in the month of Ramadan is like or has the same rewards as worship. No, no. He's saying, نَوْمُكُمْ فِيهِ عِبَادَةٍ Your sleep in the month of Ramadan is an act of worship. Which is why somebody was saying, you know, I said to him, so what have you done during this holy month? He said, well, I've been worshiping Allah 24-7. Sleeping it off the whole month 
which is which is fine. I mean, it's, if you want to stick with the bare bones minimum, fine. Sleep through the whole month. But we want more. And that's why we're here. We want to maximize. We want to use this launch pad that is the month of Ramadan to reach very, very high places. We don't want to be content with the bare bones minimum. We don't want to just be content. Because again, someone is content with the minimum who themselves is not carrying such a big load of sin on their backs. You know what I mean? Someone who's not in debt is happy with Centrelink paying them a small amount of money every two weeks. Right? Because they don't really have a huge financial burden. They don't have to pay off a big debt. They don't have, you know, people who are in very dire need in their families. There isn't a lot of overhead. But someone who's in debt to his neck and someone who's got a huge overhead, someone who's got issues in their families, they can be content with the bare minimum. They have to strive for something bigger. They have to do a lot more than sit at home and wait for Centrelink payments to come in. And that's why sleeping in the month of Ramadan is an act of worship, but we want something more. Now by right timing as well, let me mention this point. We Scientists, and especially social scientists and psychologists, they're now talking about the 30-day th the test. If you, if you Google this, you'll find quite a lot of literature about this. People say that if you want to do something, any, whether it be to, to add a good habit, to take on a good practice, or to subtract something that you feel is a burden in your life, whether it be uh, you wanted to become a better writer, or you want to drop wasting time on Facebook. Okay? They say that if you're trying to do something, you're trying to achieve a specific goal, give it 30 days. Do it for 30 days. If you want to stop afterwards, that's fine. But if you do it for 30 days, you will condition yourself into that habit. Again, just like shedding bad habits is difficult, Acquiring good deeds and shedding bad habits, if done consistently for at least 30 days, is, it goes a long way in helping you achieve those goals. Now, it's interesting because we have a hadith that talk about 40 days. One hadith says that if you want to do something good, do it for 40 days, and then either stop or continue, it's up to you. So the imam isn't saying that you can stop after 40 days. He's leaving room for you to continue in that practice. And in fact, he's saying that if you do it for 40 days, and if you think this is difficult, in the United States, they have this thing um, annually, this, uh, this uh, competition, if you like, where in the month of November, if I'm not mistaken, they have a national novel writing contest where every November... They encourage people for people. They encourage people to write a fifty thousand word novel within thirty days. Now, again, fifty thousand words—that's almost a hundred and seventy pages. That's not a small feat. It's not, and yet tens of thousands of people in the United States actually do this. So, in the month of November, for thirty days, they write a fifty thousand word novel. If you think about it, that's not very extraordinary. It's not so out of this world. Why? Because if you divide 50 by 30 days, you end up with about 1,600 per day. Writing 1,600 words a day is not very hard. That's about four pages. Right? Not a big deal anymore. And tens of thousands of people, as I said, actually write an entire novel in one month. Now, of course, what they've done is they've randomly picked the month of November randomly pick the number 50,000 words. The whole thing is random. But what it, what, it, what it allows you to do is to know that you can do it. You can write a novel in a month. Of course, that novel isn't going to be the next Pulitzer Prize winning masterpiece. It's probably going to be garbage. But at least after 30 days, you have written a novel. And the next project you'll take on, you'll take on with more confidence, with 
more tenacity and now you know that you've done something in 30 days, now you can do something even better in three months or six months, right? So, the 40 day rule is prescribed in our hadith. The holy month of Ramadan is how many days? 30 days. Psychologists talk about doing things for 30 days. Now, it could be small incremental steps as well. And this is what's amazing about this. It doesn't, if, say for instance people want to um, take on the habit of performing Salatul Layl. The hadith says that it illuminates your face. It's something that um, almost no other act uh, is as rewarding as praying Salatul Layl. But if that's too hard, you think, then start with Salatul Ghufayla for the 30 days of the month of Ramadan. Salatul Ghufayla, two units, two rakat between Maghrib and Asha, takes about literally no longer than three, four minutes. Do that. But do it consistently every single day for 30 days. And then you'll see that on the day of the Eid, it's habitual. You have to do it. Now, not only is it a part of, of your nature, it's also rewarding. You've, you've proven to yourself that you can do it. And if you do that, you can then move on to the next challenge and the next challenge and so forth. Number two, and I'll wrap up. Number two, you need patience. Patience can be described in, in, in different manners. So you could call it patience, you could call it willpower. But I prefer the word patience because it's mentioned in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ If you're ever confronted with a challenging situation, a problem that you can't overcome, Allah says, seek help from patience and prayer. Patience has been interpreted by the Ahlul Bayt as fasting. And I believe, honestly, nothing is as powerful a motivator when it comes to willpower and building your intention, the power of intention, like fasting. Why? Because fasting is one of those things you could easily break. In fact, scholars say, that if you make the intention of breaking your fast, so you decide that I'm going to break my fast, you've already broken your fast. That doesn't mean that you could go ahead and, and munch nonstop, but it means, some scholars say, you have to repeat that day afterwards, even if you continue fasting, which you must. Why? A simple intention invalidates the fast. You could easily break it. You could easily snake, sneak out and drink you could sneak away and have a bite, can't you? And yet, it's, it's, it's amazing, but most people don't do that. Most people rise up to the challenge, and they perform the fast as best as they can. So, fasting, it builds up your willpower, makes you a strong... That's why we have a hadith that says, Man ma'ashra shabab. I'm paraphrasing. The Prophet says, O oh, youngsters, O oh, youth, those of you who can get married and find a spouse, so be it. That's your number one priority. And those who can't, they must fast. Why? The Prophet says, فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وَجَاءَ And without going into too gory details here, because I could, but waja is basically a, 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 it's a, it's a medical procedure to remove all kinds of temptations. Let's just put it that way. The Prophet says, fasting kills the desire, kills your illicit desires. Now someone might fast for a day and then say, I still want to get married desperately. I'm not saying that it takes it away, it, it, it erases it completely. But again, it's a process. So you fast for 30 days and you do so with commitment and by avoiding all of the things that invalidate the fast, including negative thoughts, including things like, I mean, we have a hadith, for instance, that says that if someone was fasting, and, and, and this is a bit of a shocker, so brace yourselves, the hadith says that if someone is fasting, and yet they look at a, at a person of the opposite gender, they look at a woman, not to gauge her beauty, not to judge her physical features, the hadith is very specific, it says that if he looks at her to judge how tall she is, right? How tall she is. 
So something pretty mundane, not exactly something people are interested in from the first moment. No. Judging how tall she is, لم يؤجر على صيامه. He will not be rewarded for his fasts. Now, being rewarded means thawab, means God giving you credit in the hereafter. It also means that reaping the benefits of the fast, actually acquiring that state of taqwa, actually acquiring the ability to strengthen your willpower and to overcome other challenges. So, to fast for 30 days and to avoid anything that is detrimental to the fast. And finally, you need a social support system. And what better social support system than having the entire society, at least those people around you, at least your family, fasting during the month of Ramadan. If not your family, your friends. So you have everybody doing the same thing, creating an environment where fasting is more bearable, where it's actually enjoyable. And finally, we must rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to seek His support, to seek His help in doing everything that we're trying to do, in making those changes lasting and meaningful, in trying to shed all those bad, negative character traits and evil habits. Never underestimate the power of dua and of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. We ask Allah to bless us, to remove all of the obstacles before us, to pave the way for us, to maximize the benefits of this incredible opportunity that we have been presented with, where we are invited to the ultimate party. We are invited to the most beautiful banquet, where we are asked to attend a function presided over by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself. Presided over by God Himself. The month of Ramadan. We ask Allah also to illuminate our hearts with the love of the Ahlul Bayt and the chance to imitate them and to follow in their footsteps, especially Amir al Mu'mineen, whose name is forever associated with the month of Ramadan in that he was martyred. Uh, on Laylatul Qadr for his love to encapsulate our hearts inshallah and to never leave it until the day we meet him at the moment of our death hada walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahumma ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin Allah